Josh Frydenberg, the Honourable Josh Frydenberg, Federal Member for Kuyong, first elected, oh by the way, in very exalted company, including Sir Robert Menzies, who was a previous member of Kuyong, first elected in 2010 and then re-elected in 2013. Seventh person since holding the seat, and Josh is the Assistant Federal Treasurer. Currently lives with his family in Hawthorne. Joss has law and economics degrees, both with honours from Monash University and completed his studies in clerkship at Mallison Stephen Jacks. Went on to graduate with masters in the international relations from Oxford University, where he attended a Commonwealth scholarship and masters in public administration from Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. Josh is a former senior advisor to Foreign Minister Alexander Downer and Prime Minister John Howard. He's also director of the global banking company of Deutsche Bank. Josh is a keen tennis player. Maybe there was a little bit more money in that, Josh. <laughs> Having represented Australia at the World University Games in England in 1991 and United States in 1993. Currently sits on the board of the Kids Tennis Foundation, which previously, uh, sorry, which provides coaching to disadvantaged kids. Josh, we give you a warm welcome. Thanks very much, Gus. Um, I'm blushing after that introduction. Um, it was very kind of you. It's great to be here. Um, firstly, uh, can I say I'm here representing the Treasurer um, Joe Hockey, who really wanted to be here, but he's now in China today, um, signing on behalf of Australia um, our membership of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which is a major initiative for the region, and Australia will be a founding me member. Otherwise, the Treasurer would be here. Uh, can I also acknowledge uh, Gladys Berejiklian, uh, the State Treasurer of New South Wales, who's done such a great job with Mike Baird in making sure New South Wales, which is one third of the national economy, um, is really uh, chugging along and uh, a budget surplus and, and privatisations are a very good sign. Can I also acknowledge my very good friend, the member for Hughes, uh, Craig Kelly, um, who uh, does a fantastic job uh, in the federal parliament and he's in a local electorate. Can I acknowledge the Mayor, uh, to, uh, to Kent, um, thank you for your warm uh, welcome to be here and can I also acknowledge the work that Barry does um, because Barry, um, to bring together such a, a large number of business leaders here is a real credit to you and, um, and hopefully will lead to a very constructive dialogue and, and hopefully more, more jobs for the Shire. Can I say as a politician, um, you don't always get to speak in front of a friendly audience, um, let alone such a big one as this. Um, Craig and I, we had the British High Commissioner come to speak to us in Canberra um, recently and a group of my colleagues, not too dissimilar in, uh, in number to hear, um, was addressing us and he got up and he said, look, he said, I once gave a speech to an audience of just one person. I said, what happened? He said, well, I gave my speech and the man in the audience, he laughed and he cried, he clapped and he cheered. And after the speech, I went down to this gentleman and I said, Sir, sir, thank you so much for that very warm reception. But unfortunately, I have to leave now. And the man pleaded with the High Commissioner, said, Please, sir, please, sir, don't do that. And the High Commissioner said, Why? And the man said, said Because I'm the next speaker. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it's great to come here and talk to you in the Shire about business and jobs and what we're doing in Canberra and, more importantly, what we can do to, uh, to help grow the, uh, the growth opportunities here. Um, this morning I was down at Alley Break uh, on the Cronulla Beach having a coffee and I thought, how beautiful is this? You've got the beach, you've got the National Park, you've got more than one million tourists every year, you've got more than 20,000 small businesses and with Captain Cook and Kernell and Botany Bay, you've got an incredible part of Australia's history here. So it's very much a, a very special place 
in Australia, here in the Shire. And I understand that there's been pressure with the closure of Caltex and the impending closure of Toyota, um, that there really is a need to try to stimulate investment, encourage innovation, and to help drive job growth. Having just come back from Canberra with Craig after a busy two weeks, I think we've helped advance that agenda significantly in the last couple of weeks. Most importantly, we've passed through the parliament and it's importantly it received um, the support of the opposition. The budget changes for small business. So a 1.5% tax cut for small business which will see some 96% of all businesses in Australia, those with a turnover of under $2 million a year. Um, they will get a boost from the tax cut, but also, most importantly, they're going to get a boost from the $20,000 instant asset write-off. And anecdotally, we've already seen a very resp uh, positive response to that initiative. Um, so we were very pleased that that legislation had successfully passed through the Senate. We are also able to get nearly $13 billion worth of savings through the Senate, including some changes around the pension, changes around the fuel excise indexation. Why that is important is because the job of budget repair uh, is absolutely foremost in the minds of Tony Abbott and Joe Hockey because the country is spending more than a billion dollars a month just servicing our interest on our debt. And if we can actually reduce the overall debt levels, we're going to be able to spend more money on schools, roads, hospitals, and support for innovation and small business. The other part of the small business and jobs package, which was some $5.5 billion in the budget, was about trying to encourage young people, particularly those who are neither in education nor in work, to try to get them job ready. And one of the initiatives, which is not that much talked about, which is, but is very significant, it's a $200 million program to partner with groups like the Brotherhood of St Lawrence to help get young people job ready by helping them learn about preparing a CV, getting in front of an employer, trying to develop the sort of skills that they will need to get a job. Because while unemployment in this country is just around 6%, youth unemployment is closer to 14%. You can go to northern Tasmania and youth unemployment is 22%. You can go to Adelaide, parts of Adelaide and it's 21% in Queensland it's high and also in parts of New South Wales. So we're really focusing on how do we get young people, particularly those ones who are neither in education into, or, uh, or in, or in uh, education or in, um, in work, how do we get them back into a, into a good job? The other thing we've done is we've created a program for, um, for work experience where we will pay an employer to take on somebody who's on income support, a young person who's on income support, for four weeks to give them 25 hours a week of work experience. It's a program that is designed to help young people. And also for people who are over the age of 50 who aren't in employment, we've come up with a program called Restart where we will pay the employer $10,000 to take on someone over the age of 50 who doesn't have a job in order to help them get into work. And with an ageing of the population, the number of people over the age of 65 in Australia will double between now and 2050. Um, we need to ensure that people can stay in the workforce much longer. And if you're 50 and you don't have a job, then you've got another 15 years of working ahead of you and we need to help you get a job. So there's a really interesting, um, expansive jobs package that goes together with small business. The other aspect of the budget which is worth mentioning is around workforce participation and particularly um, for families and particularly for mothers who, um, who haven't been able to enter the workforce because of lack of access to affordable and accessible childcare. 
and the Productivity Commission told us that there were some 165,000 Australian families who weren't entering into the workforce because they couldn't get affordable and accessible childcare. So for particularly low and middle income families, we have decided to pay up to 85% of the total cost of childcare for those families to enable them to get into the workforce. So that's going to be extremely important. There was also a record infrastructure spend in the, in the budget, which continues on the $50 billion that we spent last year. And when you consider projects like West Connects are providing thousands of jobs in this state, um, I think infrastructure is really, really important. Some of the other areas where we are focusing on um, job creation include in terms of free trade. You would have heard this government talk a lot about the three free trade agreements we've secured with the three dynamic countries in North Asia, Japan, Korea and China. We sometimes forget that we're just 23 million people here in Australia. But if you go to Japan, there are more than 120 million people. If you go to China, it's more than 1.2 billion people. More than 50 million in Korea. And India, who Andrew Robb hopes to sign a free trade agreement with by the end of this year, 1.3 billion people. These are huge economies. I mean, in China, they're moving 10 million people from the regions into the cities every year. They're building another 25,000 skyscrapers over the next couple of decades. And as people move up the income scale, suddenly everything that they do changes. Their diets change. They go from a grain-fed diet to a higher calorie diet, so they start to want our exports of beef, for example. Their tourism habits change. They suddenly want to travel, and coming to Australia becomes a lot more affordable and accessible for them. Education needs change. So in my state of Victoria, the number one export for our state is education, particularly foreign students. So it's a huge opportunity. Infrastructure needs change, and so many other areas change. Now, why that's important for the Shire is because small businesses can really capitalise on the opportunities out of this free trade agreement. And we, through Austrade, have a number of programs which are designed to assist small businesses identify those opportunities. And we've set up five key growth centres in particular areas of the economy. So there's one on advanced manufacturing, there's one on medical technologies, there's one on agriculture and food products. And those growth centres are designed to help identify opportunities in export markets for businesses big and small. To think that the Australian economy is 70% services, but of our exports, only 17% are services. And so that means financial services. That means tourism. That means health. That means education. Huge opportunities to expand our exports of services for companies big and small. And that's a real focus for us. Another focus for us relates to start-up companies. And Joe Hockey likes to tell the story of a company called Atalassian. In 2001, two graduates with hardly any money to their name from the University of New South Wales set up a software company. It's now got more than 30,000 customers worth many, many millions of dollars. And again, a small company that has become big through innovation and entrepreneurship. So we've just announced a significant tax change which has gone through the Parliament for employee share ownership schemes. Previously, if you were in a start-up company and you were given shares in that company, you were taxed as soon as you were given those shares. But you hadn't crystallised any value in that particular company. So now you're only taxed when you either sell those shares or when you turn the options into shares down the track. That's going to really help the small enterprising companies. In the budget, we said if you start up a company, 
suddenly all your legal and professional and accounting expenses that you incur can be written all off on day one. And so you don't have to write them off over a period of years, so you can write all those expenses off from day one, which will really improve your opportunities. Another area for us in terms of stimulating growth and jobs is around deregulation and cutting red tape. We've removed more than 50,000 pages from the statute books, some $2 billion worth of red tape initiatives um, for businesses big and small. And for all of you who are in business, you know what it means to fill in forms. In fact, Craig told me when he went to a, uh, a local ceremony in his electorate to give out awards to volunteers, he was asked to give an award and he was thinking, I'm going to give an award to the local fiery. I'm going to give an award to the local um, pe person working at the surf life saving club or someone who worked at the, um, in the community kitchen. In fact, he gave an award, he was asked to give an award to the person who was the best form filler, helping somebody else fill in all these government forms. And it's just a crazy situation that we've got to us ourselves in, where you spend hours of your week basically complying with local, state and federal government. I'll give you an example. In order to build a project in Australia, you need an effectively environmental approval. And the state governments and the federal governments would overlap. So one company wanted to make a major investment in Australia. It took them more than two years to get the environmental approval. It cost them more than $20 million. It required more than 10,000 pages of reports and a few thousand meetings. Now, when that happens, do you think that that company will decide to proceed or will it just pack up shop and go to another country? And that's what we've found ourselves in. So we have now moved the environmental approval process into a one-stop shop where we've basically streamlined the federal and the state processes. If you're a local aged care provider in the Shire, up until recently you've had to provide the federal government with details about every nurse that you've employed. Why do you have to do that? You shouldn't have to go through that process. If you're importing a movie into Australia, and this, let's say a movie like Kung Fu Panda, and it came in DVD, Blu-ray, um, uh, DVD, Blu-ray, um, 3D and the like, you had to get a different classification for every type, for the same movie, for every type of medium that you were showing it in. So we've said you don't need that sort of replication and cost. You can just get one approval process. So we are replicating and that sort of initiative right across the economy. I noticed that in your survey, one of the points that people uh, made was around the superannuation clearinghouse and that you weren't familiar with how that works for small business. But what we have done is we've said for all you small businesses who are paying superannuation on behalf of your employees and often would be going into different funds and taking more of your time, we will now do that centrally through the Australian Tax Office. And so that's a fantastic initiative to reduce your ability to having to pay um, the superannuation into many different funds, which takes more of your time. When people go to pay their tax, we've now developed an online portal called MyTax, which has allowed five million Australians to go online and pay their tax in a way that all the information is pre-populated um, from other sources within the government so that they don't have to spend an inordinate amount of time on their tax preparation. These are the type of things that we're doing to try to cut red tape to try to create jobs. And then another big issue is obviously around tax reform more generally. And we have a tax discussion paper which the Treasurer released earlier this year. It's part of a three-stage process. We'll be releasing a green paper in around October and then next year we'll have a white paper which will crystallise the tax reforms that we take to the next election. And I want to thank um, Shy Biz for making a, um, for making a, uh, a report 
which I think is going to be really helpful for us um, to try to, uh, to work through what are going to be the best initiatives in tax reform. In Australia, we have 125 taxes, but just 10 taxes produce 90% of the revenue. We have 115 taxes in Australia that produce just 10% of the revenue. So we are completely overtaxed, and the previous speaker referred to payroll tax. I think that's a terrible tax because it's effectively a penalty on people who employ. But it's a state tax, and the state government, understandably, won't want to remove it until it gets something in return. Now, when the GST first came in during the Howard and Costello years, they got rid of 30 other taxes, and there was that huge consolidation. We need to continue with the path of consolidation of our tax system because there's some $40 billion a year of compliance on individuals and business. And so we're looking at all elements um, of the tax system as part of this discussion paper. And finally, I note that one of the uh, points that were made in the context of your Shire Biz um, uh, survey was that 80% of people who were surveyed said that the threshold for GST for the purchase online from overseas should come down from $1,000 where it is today to something much lower. So currently, if I go and buy a watch down the street here for $250, I pay GST. If I go and buy the same watch from Hong Kong online and arrives in two days' time for $250, I don't pay the GST. This is really hurting jobs in Australia because the amount of people who are going online is going up like that. And with a $1,000 threshold, we're really missing out in creating a level playing field for domestic suppliers. And when you look at the United Kingdom, their threshold is 15 pounds. In Canada, it's 20 Canadian dollars. And in the United States, they put a GST or a, or a VAT on all online sales from overseas. So this is something that we're working through with the states, and this is something that Mike Baird has strongly um, supported. And just to finish, can I say that I feel um, that the Australian economy is really starting to strengthen. Our growth in the March quarter was 0.9%, which was the highest level in the, developing, in the developed world and the highest level among the G7 countries. We've seen over the last 18 months more than a quarter of a million jobs being created, three times faster in 2014 than in 2013. Building construction for residential properties is up around 16% over the last year. Exports are up 5% and service export of services is up even more than that. So there are some very positive signs and of course with record low interest rates, the lowest interest rates since the 1960s at just 2% in terms of the cash rate. And of course with a low Australian dollar which has come down considerably, there are significant opportunities in the Australian economy. I wish the Shire all the very best um, going forward. Certainly I speak for the Treasurer and myself and Craig as federal representatives and of course my good friend Scott Morrison, the local member, who does such a great job. I speak for all of us when we say we want the businesses here to be prosperous, we want them to be innovative and we want them to create jobs and we'll do everything we can to help that. Thank you very much. Please stay there, Josh. Um, this may not be the most friendliest part of your speech. <laughs> Are there any questions for our Assistant Treasurer? Malcolm Gunning, the President of the Realist Institute in New South Wales. Uh, property taxes. Um, obviously, it's well publicised, the amount of stamp duty that the Baird government looked to achieve this year, $7 billion. Uh, capital gains tax. Is there any modelling about possibly increasing GST, wiping some of these taxes out? Or then you've got uh, uh, you know, your other uh, concessions. 
Is there any modelling that the Treasury is looking at as far as that's concerned? Well, as you will see in the discussion paper, um, all those issues are touched upon. Um, in terms of the GST, we've made it very clear that you cannot lift the GST without bipartisan support. Um, if you go back to 1998, when John Howard took the GST to the Australian people, he went into that election with this huge majority of seats from 1996, and he actually lost the two-party preferred vote. And him and Peter Costello were great advocates. And the opposition uh, at the time was dead against the GST. Now it's become uh, accepted. Uh, but the message out of that is it's very hard to get that sort of tax reform unless you get bipartisanship. And yes, the state, all the money goes to the state, so you'd think some of those Labor states would support it. But we have no plans to increase the GST, and if there was to be any change, it would need to be bipartisan. Um, that being said, it is important for people to understand that the GST is our third largest tax. It takes in about $56 billion a, a year. But less than 50% of goods and services are actually subject to the GST, or less than 50% of our consumption is subject to the GST. And at 10%, our GST rate is actually half of what it is across the OECD, across the most developed economies in the world. And I was on a platform with the New Zealand Prime Minister, uh, Finance Minister, a guy called Bill English, just uh, last week. Um, they have a 15% GST. Um, their highest rate of company tax is 28%. And, um, and their highest rate of income tax is 33%. Now, they don't have any tax-free threshold like we do for income tax. But if you consider they've got a 33% income tax and a 28% company tax, which is lower than ours, of course, 30% for new companies, and then they've got a 15% GST. They are winning business from Australia. And we have to be very conscious of where we are, whether it's land tax or capital gains tax or company tax. I mean, we have one of the highest company tax rates in the world of 30%. If you go to the United Kingdom, their company tax rate is 20%. If you go to Singapore, it's 17%. Um, and in today's world, capital is mobile. If you're going to attract business to the Shire and people um, to the Shire to work, um, you need to ensure that you've got a competitive, we've got a competitive set of arrangements here. And this is why the tax discussion paper is so important, is how do we maintain Australia's competitiveness in light of the fact countries like New Zealand and the United Kingdom have tried to, to, to beat us to it by reducing things like their company tax. Is that on? Thank you. Um, I, I keep hearing, oh, sorry, Terry Dewing over here. I'm a chartered accountant based at Carrying Bar. Well, we have a lot of small business clients in the Southern so really at the, the grassroots with small business. So you're looking for small business really to, to give it a go and to stimulate investment. But in order for small businesses to do that, they take a real risk. You know, they have to go into their house, they have to you know, talk to their wife and say, look, I need to borrow money. The fact that, oh, sorry, I always need to talk to the husbands about borrowing money to my policies, please. Um, the accelerated depreciation, to me, doesn't cut it. I think that's an easy opt-out. And a real stimulus to um, the business investment is the old investment allowance, where we get, the business people get something for taking on the risk of going up and, and, and buying equipment. Because buying equipment will stimulate the jobs and will grow their business. I think there's also some confusion that you've lost touch of who is small business. Uh, two million dollars uh, turned over is small business, but the reality is there's another definition. It's 20 million dollars. So if you allow businesses to have 20 million dollars and invest on house to go out and stimulate, you get a much greater return than the allowance of the depreciation, the accelerated depreciation, that they are entitled to anyway, just bringing that forward. And the reality in that area, I'll bring you a counselling on my small business clients not to claim that accelerated depreciation. 
because I'm paying all the tax the next year than what they save this year. So I really to come down to stimulation, $20 million in investment amounts, and get rid of the payroll tax. That's going to be a common theme. Well, thanks very much. Um, the <laughs> two things to say. I mean, of course, we would have liked to have given a tax cut to a much larger range of companies. Um, but the issue for us is what can the budget stand at the moment? And we were bequeathed the $48 billion deficit. We've got it down to $35 billion um, over the next year, and then it will go to $7 billion in three years after that, and then hopefully a budget surplus. So we were very conscious of our overall debt position when we were framing the budget. But I would disagree with you on terms of the benefit of the accelerated um, depreciation um, because the evidence that is coming in now quite strongly is that companies are jumping on this. Um, they do see a huge opportunity and the cut-off is $20,000, so um, you, you, it does cover a lot of equipment. Um, and, and, other, and other necessary um, and other necessary things that they need for their business. Um, and, uh, and you're right, in, they still have to make the, the purchase, they still have to have the profits, they still have to you know, be an ongoing concern, but this has led to a strong increase in business um, confidence in the immediate aftermath of the budget. And, um, there was a, uh, a survey, I think it was the NAB, the NAB business survey, which found a significant jump in business confidence, particularly around small business, after that announcement. Josh, uh, Jeff Forsyth from Shibers. Church-owned businesses are able to enjoy tax-free status, often when competing with tax-paying private businesses. In the case of sanitariums selling breakfast foods against tax-paying competitors comes to mind. Is this ever to be corrected? Well, these are the sort of issues that can be um, discussed as part of the tax white paper process. Um, you know, we're very conscious that we do need level playing fields, um, but there are a whole lot of FPT-related concessions and others that are also given to the not-for-profit sector, not just and religious organisations. Um, I'm thinking, for example, public hospitals um, or benevolent institutions. Um, their staff you know, get um, significant um, FPT concessions. So uh, these are issues that we're happy to you know, have people put submissions into in the context, context of the tax discussion paper. But as you know, there are broader policy reasons why um, why these um, tax benefits exist. We've got one over here. Thank you, good morning. I'm Scott Nichols from Solid Engineering. Those of you who know me will know that I agree with Terry's comments before. Um, but I have to say, Josh, I'm actually quite sympathetic to your response as well. But I think I recognise the disconnect. We're sitting here at our level, at our grassroots level, and of course you're looking at a macro thing from the government's perspective. So no question, I suppose, really just a comment. If you could commit to going back and rereading that report from Shiners, I think we would feel as though that our voice has been heard. Thank you. Absolutely. Very happy. Paul Rosa from American Gold Supplies. We're a small business in the Shire. Um, I was very heartened to hear your comments about the low value import threshold because it's been an ongoing bugbear for us both in the practicality of it and the complete lack of logic in our government underwriting the overseas businesses. Do you have a time frame for addressing that because it wasn't in the recent budget? Um, well, the treasurers are coming together mid-year uh, and I'm sure this will be a topic that um, some of the state treasurers may seek to raise. The difficulty, um, and I, I've been a staunch advocate for, for bringing down this threshold for some time. The difficulty is because it's a GST uh, related issue, you need all the states to agree. And the one state that is holding out is Western Australia. And they're not holding out because 
they don't believe in the merit of bringing down the threshold. In fact, they'll be a great beneficiary because they'll get all this additional money, which could be hundreds of millions of dollars in terms of the, blow, the national pool that will be separated at the states. They're holding up because they think they've been done on the GST full stop. So they only get 30 cents back in the dollar for their GST contribution. And as you know, the federal government reacted to that by making a special provision to Western Australia some nearly $500 million for infrastructure spending uh, because they have gone way below any, where any other state is at. In fact, no other state has been below 80 cents in the dollar, and they're down at 30. So they're really, really angry over there. And one of the things that they're holding hostage is reform on this GST online issue. So we're engaging with them and saying, you know what, there's real merit in, in a change here. Um, more businesses in Western Australia are being held back because of the online um, threshold being too high, and you'll also be a beneficiary from increased revenue. So hopefully that will get started. All right, Paul Camper from Camper Chartered Accounting. Often we deal with small to medium enterprises and we deal with the distortions in the system. So that goes both ways. That goes from the perspective of the government having distortion to their advantage and the opposite way where there's a distortion in the system from the client's perspective. But often those distortions aren't discussed. So we also always discuss high level reform. But there could be little changes within the laws and the system, which could make things more efficient, which could, for example, the taxing discretionary trusts. At the moment, the ATO made a change in 2010 that complicated its function with small business enterprise. And in submitting to the government, they would write back to you without any conversation or where that's going to go. What they did is they created a remedy, which created more red tape. So you remedied the issue that then was changed and then made small business owners and or investors, many that are in this room, hours more of compliance, which is crazy. You could talk about superannuation where, from your perspective, you get people entering the pension phase and contributing at the same time. When I discuss this with clients, they can't actually believe you can do that. But you can, distortion not fixed. So often we have these things. It's also with regards to compliance, if you trade in seven different states, you have seven different payroll taxes to lodge, seven different workers' compensations to lodge. The federal government could advocate a state tax clearinghouse, which would probably cost the government $20 million to do, which could save millions of dollars worth of compliance. Not only that, the calculators would work to get the right tax to every state. At the moment, there's often in medium businesses, people don't actually understand the law to make those changes. So we always have a large reform agenda, very rarely implemented because it's too hard to get through Parliament. But these small distortions, the public wouldn't preach to. So I ask, this is probably more relevant for your portfolio as well. How is, how are you guys going to advocate this and how can we have a soundboard to discuss these problems within the government? You raise some very good points there, and we, we would be all ears to that. If you want to put those um, those examples to me, um, I would be very happy to, to have a look at that directly, um, as well as obviously through the tax discussion paper, because you're right, those, those sort of unintended consequences of legislation can be very, very costly. So we're happy to, happy to advance that and, and, and to look at it. In terms of harmonisation, you're right, um, you know, whether it's workers' comp, whether it's payroll tax, whether it's trading hours, you know, when you've got national businesses working across state boundaries, um, huge amounts of red tape are incurred. So on this issue of payroll tax, um, there has been some discussion among the state treasurers about how do they work together to harmonise that system. Um, and, uh, and I think we can make some improvements there. Gosh, Tom Croucher, Councillor on Sutherland Shire Council. You mentioned the need for real taxation reform and I wholeheartedly support that. You also mentioned that there is a, one hurdle is the uh, need for bipartisanship 
uh, support. I also wonder how government is going to overcome the other more significant hurdle, and that is there is a whole sector uh, who would oppose the need for um, simplified taxation system because they have massive investment in the way things are now. Um, many universities in Australia employ a, a professor of taxation law and have schools of taxation study with staff, students, courses. But the Commission of Taxation itself uh, has an empire of staff which he would lose, uh, his power would, would diminish, his influence would diminish if we had a very simple taxation system. Um, many people in the legal, legal system um, do very nicely out of the legal uh, taxation system being very complex. They, um, I don't want to cast any dispersion on financial people, but there would be sectors in the financial community, sorry, the, the financial industry, who, uh, who do, do better by having a system more complex. All of those uh, groups I just mentioned have an interest in it remaining as it is. Yet these would be the first people government would turn to for advice and help on uh, reforming the taxation system. How would you propose to overcome that, that hurdle? Well, there's no easy answer to that. Um, other than to say it's not the accountants and the, the lawyers and the financial planners who make the laws. It's effectively people's representatives and the politicians. And um, we do this as a small business. Um, and we're very conscious of this $40 billion annual compliance burden. So that's why we've made um, deregulation such a focus for us as a government. I mean, when you get federal judges saying that they don't even understand the Tax Act because it's so complex, um, you know you've got a serious problem. So we've assigned two sitting days of the Parliament every year to repealing unnecessary regulation. And it's based on what they've done in the United States through their Congress, and they call it, um, we call it appeal days, they call it the corrections calendar. And effectively, we in the Parliament debate for the whole day moves to, to rationalise our legislation and our processes. And to think that just in a little time we've been in government, we've, we've actually cut more than two years old with the red tape, would indicate that we've actually had quite a lot of success. And the Tax Act is one area where the Prime Minister is, is very keen for <coughs> reform. And the fact that we're moving online with um, you know, the online portal, my tax and my gov, and the fact that a lot of that information for people about submitting their tax returns is now automatically repopulated, um, shows you that with new technology you can actually make significant inroads to do so. I agree with you, there are a lot of risks and interests. Uh, we like to keep the status quo, but there's also a government will to do something. Josh, Mike Lewis, my name from SC Partners, where a local accounting firm specialises in solvency and forensic accounting. Um, What's the balance here? <laughs> I want to quickly talk about the elephant in the room, which is um, in particular what was absent from the last election, which is industrial relations reform. Um, Obviously, for so obvious reasons why it was uh, not part of the last election um, in this current term, but certainly the next term of government, it's very important that we see industrial relations reform. So my question to you is, when are we going to bring industrial relations reform on the front page for discussion? Well, that's a good question. Um, I noticed that in the Shire, the reading on the theory, you've got over 4,000 businesses involved in the construction related space. So it's not just big companies, it's also small small companies, independent contractors and others who are affected by the overall industrial relations climate. Um, we have one big initiative that we've been trying to push through this parliament uh, where we've been blocked by our political opponents, which would have a six billion dollar annual productivity dividend to the Australian economy in the field of industrial relations. And that is the reinstitution of the Australian Building Infrastructure Commission. This was this came out of the Coal Oil Commission, which happened during the Howe government, which found that there was lawlessness on our building sites. And the ABCC, the Australian Building Infrastructure Commission, was effectively a cop on the And that was removed during the previous government. 
So we want that back. That's a really big first start. The second thing that we want to do uh, is take up some of the uh, recommendations out of the Productivity Commission's review, which is currently underway with the Fair Work. And there are a lot of areas that they're looking at. I mean, they're looking at penalty rates, they're looking at um, a whole lot of other areas, I think more than 20 different areas. Uh, we want to consider their recommendations and then take the necessary action. And then, of course, we've got the Royal Commission, which is currently underway, uh, into, um, into elements of union activity, which is raising many, many questions about um, unlawful behaviour, where there will need to be further um, further reform. So when that commission has reported, when the Productivity Commission recommendations are in, and hopefully when we can get the ABCC through the Parliament, I think you'll see uh, a lot better industrial relations in Parliament. Uh, 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 very big welcome to the show. My name is Leonard Young. I'm an author and a risk consultant, as well as a former accountant. <laughs> my, I really to commend you on your commitment to review the big uh, super funds and governments. As you may know, uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, some time ago, uh, uh, they did a survey on the uh, super fund governments and they said that uh, uh, improved governance for super funds could increase uh, the rate of return for these super funds by at least uh, maybe half a cent. Yeah. Uh, I, I know this is something very close to the heart now and to improve the, uh, the type of uh, super funds board uh, oh, yes. uh, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking in terms of the industry funds. Yes. Yes. Uh, the type of directors being appointed to the board. Yeah. Now, you, you mentioned that uh, there should be one third uh, of the uh, of, you know, board members or to be independent characters. Why do you stop at one third? Why don't you go up to, let's say, 50% or something? Okay. Um, very good question. So last week, I announced um, and I released a draft legislation to require all superannuation funds that are called, that are APRA regulated, regulated by the Australian Federal Regulatory Authority. So it doesn't include self-managed super funds, but it includes retail funds, corporate funds, government funds, and industry funds. That they would require at a minimum one third of their directors to be independent and the chairperson to be independent. Now, we did this on the basis of recommendations from two key reports. One of those reports was by a man called Jeremy Cooper, called the Cooper Review to the previous Labor government, which called for one third of those directors to be independent. And the other report was by David Murray through the financial system inquiry uh, to the Abbott government at the end of the last year, which said that a majority of directors should be independent with an independent chair. What they, why they made that re those recommendations and why APRA have said that independent directors are good is because it brings people with more expertise and experience to the board of those superannuation funds. And there's currently $2 trillion worth of Australians' hard-earned savings in superannuation. But because superannuation is compulsory, and it rises from 9.5% to 12% between 2021 and 2025, that $2 trillion will turn into $9 trillion. So Australia has the fourth largest pool of superannuation funds anywhere in the world. The United States, Japan, the United Kingdom, and then Australia. And it's growing rapidly. So I say to the teachers and to the nurses and to everyone else, if you've got your hard-earned savings in superannuation, you don't want your board to just represent you know, your employer group or just represent your union. You need people with a broader range of experience. In fact, a lot of people with money in superannuation no longer are working in that sector. They might be retired. And so you need a broader set 
of representatives. Now, I'm very pleased that National Seniors, Choice, COSBOA, which represents the Small Business, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Business Council of Australia, um, ASFA, which is representing um, all APRA regulated funds, all those groups have come out and strongly welcomed the government's initiative. The people who haven't supported us so far are a lot of the people in the industry funds and a lot of people in the unions and the Labor Party. Surprise, surprise. And that's because, you know, um, I don't think they want to change the status quo because they've got some pretty cosy relationships. Now, why didn't we go further than this? If we went further to a majority, um, I think it would have been more difficult to get it through the Senate, to be honest, uh, because Labor and the Greens are likely to oppose. And we need six out of the eight crossbenches of the Senate to vote for us. Currently, there are 33 coalition senators, 25 Labor senators, 10 Greens and eight independents. Now, we need six of those eight independents to get any of our legislation through. And I'm hopeful we can get this thing through. But I think if it was a majority, it would have been quite a big shock to the system. And I don't, it would have been more difficult to get it through the Senate. So we were pragmatic. And we also think that one third strikes the right balance with a chairman. And we've also given a three year transition period because people are currently appointed to boards for around three years. So they've now got those three years to make those adjustments. But I think, given the size of superannuation, given the importance of superannuation, I think this is a very important, I think this is a reform which will really add value to people who've got their hard earned savings in super. We've got one more over here. Thank you very much, Assistant Treasurer. My name is Joanne Sieve. I'm a uh, solicitor and I've um, practised in the area of state taxes for the past nearly 30 years. Lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so um, you did mention, you know, we, we currently have about 125 taxes. 30 were abolished. That makes, makes it, um, we were up around 155, um, around 2000, just before 2000. Um, the process that you've outlined for uh, the discussion paper, the green, yep. and then the white paper, and the fact that you require, as it was historically with the GST, the agreement with all states and territories, just where the states and territories fit in with that process and how they come in at the end to agree with it all. Um, I only just ask, would it be better for states and territories to be part of the journey, to be actually involved with reading all the submissions, including by the Shire and others? to have a Treasury official committed at that level so that when we get to the end, there is some hope that for the future there will be a simplified tax system in Australia. I'll speak certainly for myself having practised in, in the area. I wouldn't, I genuinely wish to contribute for the sake of a better future. I'd much rather have a different type of job <laughs> than focused on this, the complexity, the, the disharmony amongst the states and territories. And finally, if I can add one other question, put a question. We see New South Wales, with its most recent budget, having uh, collected two point, uh, seven point, roughly 7.2 billion in transfer to revenue, 1.2 billion over budget, and yet over 30 years of racket creep unaddressed. Is there not uh, the cries from the media and the public to the state about uh, addressing the bracket creep have not been heard? Is that not something also that the Commonwealth could assist with? Thank you. Um, very good points. Um, we are not operating in a silo on tax reform. We are constantly engaged with our state counterparts uh, on this issue, both at a treasury um, treasurer's level, and I know Joe Hockey and Gladys Verjiklian do work closely together, but also at an official's level. So um, you can rest assured that we are closely engaged. The other thing is we've got a federation uh, white paper process that is running concurrently with the tax white paper. And that is looking at broader issues as how do we get the federation to work more closely and there is quite a lot of overlap with what we're doing um, in, in other areas. 
like, uh, like tax reform. Um, and then on your issue of bracket creep, um, bracket creep is terrible for the economy because the, the more, uh, the higher the marginal tax rate for somebody, the less likely they're going to want to stay in the workforce or enter into the workforce or work a bit longer. The problem is governments become addicted to that revenue. And so while it looks good on the balance sheet, it actually does, it's not good for the economy in long term. So again, we've got this dilemma. How do we, in our current budget situation, address the issue of bracket creep, which does need to be addressed over time? And uh, this is something we're, we're very, very focused on. Um, to give you one, um, one statistic that's, that's flagged in the discussion paper, um, I think 27% of Australians are currently in the top two tax brackets. So 80 to 180 and then 180 above. Um, that number goes to 42% over the next 10 years. So millions of Australians are going to be into that higher tax bracket as a result of effectively bracket creep. And this is something that we need to take, take into account in the context of the broader tax debate, as well as looking at the other issues like company tax, which we have 800,000 companies paying company tax in Australia, but just 12 companies pay one third of the total tax take. And so for Australia, we're thinking, okay, what happens if one of those companies goes offshore, one of those companies collapses, one of those companies merges, suddenly we're losing a significant share of our company tax take. So all of these issues, whether it's bracket creep, capital gains, land tax, um, uh, GST, all those issues are canvassed at length in the discussion paper, and I thank the Shire for making a significant contribution to that discussion. Thank you. Thank you.